as you guys know, we talk a lot about niches when we talk about like starting VCFO services and marketing everything. So today is going a little bit deeper into that and we're keeping it inside with some internal experts doing that. So my name is Tom Waddleton. I am a virtual CFO here at Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. As I think of niches, I look today and of my client base, 60% of my clients sit in a creative agency niche. So I'll talk about that more, but it just kind of had me reflecting on like, so how much of niches is impacting me? And it does a lot, but it also reflects kind of how the company, that's approximately the number of clients we have in the creative agency niche as a whole. Okay, a couple housekeeping things. Today is a one credit hour course. People need to entire, attend the entire 50 minutes. We do have three poll questions, so we need people to answer all three of those. Usually I'll announce those, not always. Um, we do send out the CPE certificates in the presentation and if people use the question function. So can't talk to us, but the most common question that we get individually is, do you have, can I get a copy of the slides and can I get the CPE certificate? So yes and yes, and slides were not sent out in advance of this. Okay, I mentioned that I work with Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. So let me tell you just a little bit about us. We did, and you can see Jody and Adam there in the picture, we started as a traditional CPA firm, so tax and audit focused, like lots of firms, a little bit more than 20 years ago. Starting in 2004, we started offering back office CFO and accounting services to clients. Really doubled down on that as we moved toward 2013 as our main service offering, and then became a fully distributed firm. Very unique before the pandemic. Now, lots of companies are remote and hybrid, but all of our team now is remote. And gives us tons of flexibilities on where our employees are as well as where our clients are. Last in 2022, we joined Andrew CPA and Advisors. So a firm based in St. Louis, Missouri. We are now part of them and we're the virtual CFO team at Anders. And so now we are a hybrid workforce as they do have an office in St. Louis with a lot of people working sometime in the office and then also sometimes at home. So that tells you a little bit about our firm. To quickly introduce our speakers, and luckily you're going to hear from both of them. Kelly Schuknecht is our Director of Marketing. So as we talk niches and what we do with them, she's our expert in actually making it work as we talk about it and make it all sound really easy. But we know there's a good. ton of work behind the scenes. Good job on pronouncing my name, Tom. You did good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. No, I should mess up Guillermo. It's just <laughs> didn't do poorly. So Guillermo Rodriguez is one of my peers as a virtual CFO, and you'll hear that he really focuses on the cannabis industry, one of our niches in his background in that. So we brought you two CFOs who work in a niche and then our marketing director who actually helps all this come together. Okay. So with all of that intro, Kelly, for everyone who's listening to this and in the pre, I was going to say, is it niche or niche, but I think all of us say niche. So that didn't seem to be an argument, but tell me kind of where I, you land on that. This word drives me crazy because I will say it differently to, based on the sentence that I'm saying around mm -hmm. it. I don't, I don't uh -huh. know why, but um, yes. Anyway, so we'll say niche for the purpose of this webinar. Uh, but if I, if I change it up once in a while, I, I, yeah. it's just what, what happens. Um, I think we all pretty much know what a, a niche is, right? So a specialized um, segment of the market. I, I like to think of it like um, in publishing. So my background before I came to, to Summit was in publishing. And in the publishing industry, you might have one publisher who will publish any kind of book, right? Any kind of genre. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, some some publishers are very specialized. And so you might have a, a publisher who only publishes children's books. That is their area of focus. And um, for that publisher, you know, they, they really build up a team of people who um, are very specialized in, in that, right? So they have a lot of um, illustrators, they have, you know, their, their team just really knows children's books. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a, a non-accounting example, um, <laughs> but mm -hmm. as accountants in the room, you know, the, the niche is, you know, what is that specific area that you want to focus on for your accounting practice? Um, we do have a, a poll question up right now, but I, I, um, so after you answer the poll question, would love for you to, uh, put into the comments, into the chat, mm -hmm. um, just what, uh, what niche do you focus on? Or if you don't focus on what one right now, what niche do you want to focus on? Um, would love to just kind of hear from, uh, the attendees and just get an idea of, of where people are at with that. Yeah. And if people would please use the Q&A function, would be great. You got to chat in the okay. Q&A. Let's use Q&A 
for that. <laughs> so Kelly, we've got 94% of answered. Um, actually, let me end the poll and I'll just show the result. And sure, you can tell yeah. me if you're surprised by this. Share the result. Okay, so you should see it looks like what, about 60% are in those bottom three questions, like, hey, we've considered or we're not doing it. And then a little higher than I would have expected is that 44%, I think, are saying either well-defined or we have expertise, but it doesn't impact that. Does that surprise you, those results? Well Kind of, because uh, the, the topic of this webinar is on why you need a niche, right? So I'd love to know for those who um, who are already uh, focused on certain niches and kind of feel a little, um, you know, a little bit high on the expertise scale um, uh, in that. So what, what drew you to this webinar? Um, so that we, as we're talking, we can um, hopefully address your specific questions or kind of the areas that you wanted to learn more. Yeah. So we've got 25% who said, yep, we've got a well-defined niche yeah, and yeah. no one yet is putting the question what their yeah. niche is. So yeah. <laughs> we, we should be able to track you down and call you out if you're not going to answer that. <laughs> okay. So I'll let you know as those come in. Yeah. Great. Well, yeah. So, you know, Summit, we, many of you who are watching probably are aware of this, that we uh, have specialized in the creative agency industry for, um, I don't know, Tom, what is it like 10 plus years, 10, 12 years, I yes. think yep. um, longer than I've been with, with the firm, but um, we, that's been our, 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 um, our niche, right. Our specialty. We mm -hmm. um, do a lot of speaking engagements. Um, we, we create a lot of content that's for creative agencies. Um, we train our team uh, around creative agencies and kind of their, their special um, needs for that, that um, industry, as far as their KPIs and um, kind of just, you know, the things that are very unique to that industry. Right. Um, and about a year and a half ago, our leadership team um, decided that um, what we wanted to tr to try to do was to to expand and kind of clone that that um, not clone the niche, but clone that um, kind of strategy yep. um, with additional industries. So, um, you know, we we went through kind of an exercise, and we'll talk through this a little bit later in the presentation. But um, uh, you know, we wanted to focus on growing. Uh, industries, right? So like, what are those industries that are growing? Um, and we needed to have specific people in place, um, rather than going out and finding somebody who was an expert in these areas, we wanted to utilize our internal team. Um, and, you know, we had, we happened to have some team members who had expertise in these areas um, in the past. So um, we, we we kind of launched, I would say, launched in June um, of this year, these additional three industries. So legal services, cannabis operators, and then tra transportation and logistics. And um, Guillermo is our, our uh, cannabis um, special spe uh, specialized CFO. So our right. thought leader in that industry. Um, and I'd love to, you know, have you talk a little bit, Guillermo, just about your experience there and kind of how, how that came about that we hired you for a virtual CFO and then you became kind of our, our thought leader in that space. Yeah. Thanks Kelly. And I, I mean, I can definitely identify with, with the poll results of being in a place where you haven't chose your, your niche yet. Mm -hmm. Cause that was my journey. I didn't know what I was going to do. I worked in corporate for a lot of years and then went into consulting, doing sp projects like one at a time. And then when I decided I wanted to do client facing work and work with multiple clients, I knew that I had to choose a niche. And I went through kind of the process of, of trying to pick, pick what, what I would eventually do. And I got to say, like when I started, I was, I took a little bit of a break from, from that work and I was trying to develop the concept where I would focus on and I was a bit paralyzed. So I went through that. And what I can say is like my background was in construction and in engineering. And so I said, well, I'm going to go into construction and engineering. But when I thought about it, I just wasn't motivated at all. I was like, mm. you know, I, I, I can't go forward with this. So um, that's kind of how I knew in my gut that wasn't the right the right path for me. But then when I found started learning a little bit more about the cannabis industry, I found a course about the you know the accounting nuances in it. I got really excited, and so that's kind of what propelled me to get into it. And later on, we're going to talk about uh, who do you serve, right, and who can you serve. And for me, I had a strong background in cost accounting from my construction days. So I said, 
you know, cannabis, at least the more technical side of it is in the manufacturing and the cultivation. And so I could really take that knowledge that I had in construction and go into, into cannabis. So I said, this makes a lot of sense for me. And I got motivated to, to then get started with all the, as Tom mentioned, the tremendous work from a marketing standpoint that it takes to actually pave your way into an industry and into a niche. And so that's kind of what started it for me and why we chose it or why I chose it. And I know why the, uh, the firm chose it is just the tremendous growth that that we see in the industry as you know more states are legalizing uh, cannabis programs. And so there's just a lot of growth and a lot of opportunity to become an expert in the field because of the regulatory environment. And so you, know, you can imagine a prospect or a client, you know, talking with them. And if you don't know anything about the cannabis market in California versus a new state like Missouri, you know, those are the kind of things that you have to kind of know where, how they operate and what the overall market is. And then the other, the other, uh, this might be a bit unique, but I found that a lot of CPAs weren't servicing cannabis. So, right. um, a lot of firms were actually staying away from it. Kind of afraid and of it. so I felt like that was a good opportunity. And like, for example, I had a call from, um, an attorney that I met at a conference last year and he called out and he's, you know, he's a business attorney helping applicants with licensing. And he reached out and said, are you, are you still in, in cannabis? And I said, you know, I joined Anders and kind of gave him the spiel and he went to our website and he's like, okay, yeah, I did confirm that you're actually in cannabis. So, you know, hmm. it's a real life example yeah. of how, you know, when you're working with prospects, they really do go look at your marketing material, not just what you say, what you're putting out in the world to know that you're really in that, in that niche. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Kelly, I think it's worth clarifying. We've gotten two questions where people are referring to things like fraud and forensics and tax as their niches. And at least the way we're ah, using the term today is yes. much more industry focused where I'd probably use the term specialization for that. You could argue that, but at least people are going to hear from the rest of today. We're talking much more industries that we focus on than like the specific services. To totally yeah. agree that accountants may want to focus and it makes sense not to say I can do whatever you want. And I'm really good at this one area, but we're going to talk more and more about in, uh, ni industry niches. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great point. So I think of that more of, of kind of your service area versus your, mm -hmm. um, your target audience. Right. So when we're talking about the niches, we're talking about our target audience. Um, for virtual CFO services specifically um, for us, but you know you could provide other accounting services for different industries. Um, so it, again, you know, going back to my publishing example, I think of like mm -hmm. so a children's book publisher is only publishing children's books, books that are for children, but um, they, you know, somebody else may be providing, let's say, like the illustration services. Well, those are mm -hmm. you know a part of. Um, the publishing process, right? But it's it's different from you know who you're trying to reach is is um, children's books authors. Um, I guess in both cases you're trying mm -hmm. to reach ch children's books authors, but one is publishing the books and one is you know doing providing a service. So yeah. um, I don't know. I, it, does that uh, address that? Do you think, Tom? I think it does. Yeah, and we'll, we'll yeah. continue talking industries as we go forward. And we will talk a little bit about uh, in a little bit. We'll talk about kind of um, the service areas and the the niche as we're talking about the the target. Mm -hmm. Um, audience and kind of how those come together. Um, so, so yeah, good question here, right? So um, does niching down limit my opportunities? So I think of this like, um, you know, so looking at the, the, the chart uh, and, and starting from the left side and, you know, so the whole world is my opportunity. I can reach any kind of company with my service, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it gets scary if we start thinking about like, well, if I niche down to the specific service area, um, it, am I going to limit like who I, who I really can reach? Like, what if I want to reach everybody? Right. Um, and I think that's mm -hmm. a common fear, uh, when people think about like picking a specific niche and, and, you know, working directly with just that audience. Um, Oops. but no, no, this is perfect. Yep. I was, I was. Go into the next you one. So, next one. Okay. yep. So, but um, but if you're trying to attract everyone, you're going to attract no one. Um, and I was telling you this uh, the story, Tom, earlier that um, yesterday actually I met with somebody who ha is going through our virtual CFO playbook course, mm -hmm. learning how to provide virtual CFO services. And um, you know, I asked, you know, okay, what is your what is your goal? Well, growth is the goal. That's that's his goal. Mm -hmm. um, 
but you know, I said, okay, so then who are you working with? What is the specific, uh, you know, are, are you working with a, a certain niche? Um, and he was like, no, I can work with anything. And then he, you know, you know, mentioned several industries that he um, can work with. And I'm like, that's great. But like, how are you going to reach those audiences? If you want to talk to all of them, if, you know, if you're, if I want to talk to cannabis operators and virtual CFO or excuse me, creative agencies, um, the content that I'm putting out there is not going to attract both of them. They both have very specific needs. Um, right. And if I'm trying to attract everyone with my content, my content is going to be so general that it's not going to speak specifically to the audience that I want to attract or to any audience that will uh, result in me attracting that, that audience, right? Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Tom. Um, so I look at this like, okay, so I provide accounting services, right? So that's, that. this is, um, you know, where we start out. Like I can provide services to everyone. Um, then we look at, I, pro I can provide accounting services for businesses. So that's getting a little more specific, right? Um, then I can provide, provide accounting services for cannabis businesses. Okay, so now I'm getting a little more specific in who my audience is. Um, then I can provide virtual CFO services for licensed cannibal, cannabis, cannibal, cannabis <laughs> operators. Um, so now I'm, now I'm saying this is my specific service I'm providing. So whether it's, you know, that question that was coming up before, whether it was, you know, the uh, forensics fraud or, or fraud or yep. Yep, any of those specific areas, that's okay if that's the service you're providing. Um, but who are you providing that to, right? So um, then the next would be I provide virtual CFO services for cannabis operators and then getting really specific about um, their their annual revenue between the, you know, two and 20 million. Right. So now now as I'm developing content or, you know, thinking about speaking engagements for Guillermo and where mm -hmm. we want to send him and, um, you know, if we want to you know, put them on podcasts, whatever those things are that from a marketing perspective to reach that audience, we're really clear now on who we're trying to reach. Um, do we want to, do we want to reach the, the mom and pop uh, cannabis shops? No, we want, we want them to be at least $2 million because before that, they're probably not going to um, need or be able to afford our services. If they get above the 20 million, then they're probably too big for us and they, they might need to hire an in-house uh, CFO. Uh, they don't right. need the fractional service. They may need more you know, hands-on um, in, in the office or you know, whatever, available to them full-time kind of person. Yeah, um, probably the, the point that yeah. I often make to accounting firms that we coach when they talk about, well, limit my opportunities is, for Summit, even after 10 years of going after creative agencies, almost half of our clients are not creative agencies. So my belief is yeah. we provide a really good service and they're coming and saying, I'm not creative. Can you provide the VCFO? So even though we've been putting yep. out there, this is our target. Mm -hmm. When others come, it doesn't mean that you turn them down, but it does mean this is how you go after some after. So after I think a really successful marketing effort that we do, we still get lots of customers that are in other industries. So I don't think it limits us. Yeah, we do. We So we, we, we have gotten more and more uh, direct with our content to speak to our target audience over, mm -hmm. you know, over the years. And it is funny because we will get uh, people reach out to us on the website and we're like, why did this type of business come to it? They still yes. do. And we right. don't, we're not going to turn them down, right? So we are specific about having a niche, but it doesn't mean that we won't work with other companies. We right. just want to make sure that we're reaching our target audience and, yeah. and bringing those people in. Yeah. But yeah, we we yeah. do see. So it's actually 60% of our current clients are digital agencies okay. and the other 40% fall in other areas. Yeah. Sorry, Guillermo, were you going to say something? No, I, 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 that's a good point. I think Tom kind of read my mind because I, as I was going through and I was starting, that was kind of my thought too, is, is does that mean that I'm not going to folk, that I'm not going to work with other kind of clients? And the answer is like, absolutely not. You're going to, you, especially when you're starting out, going to work with all other types of clients and going back to my example is that, yes, I was excited about cannabis, but I'm also excited about just virtual CFO services in general and have a passion for that. So even clients within the construction industry, you know, I'd be thrilled to work with. And so we're really talking about the marketing as aspect here and where we need to focus, because this has also happened to me as well is where I lose my focus and then I'm all over the place. And, you know, as I was going through this, I was, you know, sending out pitch letters to speak on on podcasts. And I, like, I got one the other day and it was for construction and I sent it over for, to the marketing team. And I was like, Hey, can I go, um, 
speak at this one. And then y'all are really good about focusing me back into Canvas. So sometimes <laughs> I, I really need that too. So it's good to work with, with, with the marketing team. And if you have someone uh, on your team that can provide that accountability to keep you focused on your strategy, that's helpful too. But if not, going to just have to be mindful to, to stay on track to where you're, where yeah. you're trying to go. Was that a location thing, Gamera? Like it was in a really cool place. That's why you wanted to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, no, sorry. <laughs> it was in the Bahamas. I was like, I'm going to go to the next call. Yes. <laughs> Caught you. Um, all right. So poll question launched. Um, I also have a question, just uh, unofficial poll question um, for folks to put in the Q&A. Just, yeah. um, I'm curious at this stage, everything we've been talking about, uh, does niching down scare you? Um, mm -hmm. So I want to know kind of as everything we presented so far, does this, you know, this graphic that's on the screen, like going from this really big audience down to this really small, I mean, see, I say really small, we'll get into numbers later. It's not actually yeah. that small, but um, the smaller looking audience, does that, does that scare you and, you know, share any thoughts on that? Um, so Guillermo, I think you're going to um, talk through the next stage of uh, does it limit down my opportunities? Um, and here's the opposite way to look at it, right? Yeah, does niching down limit uh, my opportunities? And I, I just kind of to my comment from earlier, I think not niching down is really what what limits the opportunities because you can't focus on everything and there's just not enough time in the day to to focus your marketing efforts on on all industries and so niching down like in cannabis for example it just allows you to get more specialized and get into the the issues that are really affecting the industry and to be specialized and more more selective about what you're trying to go after yeah so you know you are, you know, specialized in the cannabis industry. So that was our, our example on the last screen. And we ended with kind of your target audience um, and your specialized, you know, we've talked a little bit about the marketing. We'll, we'll get into that in a, in a little bit, um, a little bit later, uh, talking specifically about our inbound practice. Um, but, you know, with the inbound marketing, we're putting out that content and we're, we're, we're bringing people in who are seeing that content and, and um, are, are seeing that, that Guillermo is really um, knowledgeable in the industry and he knows his stuff, both on the virtual CFO side and on the cannabis in industry specifically. Um, so what happens then is, you know, it does help increase our uh, demand for our services. Um, mm -hmm. And as we, you know, we talk about a lot in these webinars and in, in the um, the course that we uh that we have for, for people who want to learn how to provide virtual CFO services, that you it actually results in you being able to charge more for your services because you are so specialized and know that industry so well. Um, in fact, Tom, you were just mentioning to me that um, some of your clients really, um, what they like from you is that you know what's going on in the industry because you're working with other clients. So like they want that inside kind of knowledge. Um, tell me about what other what other um, creative agencies are right. dealing with right now. Like how is the industry of, or the environment, the economy, thank you, I'm not an accountant, yeah. <laughs> sure. economy, you know, impacting our business and, um, you know, what are the trends that we're seeing in the industry, right? And Tom kind of has that inside knowledge because he's working with so many of them. Um, so because of that, we we become kind of, um, you know, that, that um, higher value service and we can charge more for it. And then we can also be selective, right? So if we, you know, I talked earlier about the two to 20 million um, range of the clients that we want to work with. Um, so, I mean, that's not necessarily being selective, but like we know mm -hmm. that they have to be in that range. Um, but then also we can, we can kind of weed out some of the clients that we know, like this, this is going to be, this is going to be a pro problem, right? Like if they're, if we're doing a consultation call with them and we see certain signs, like we can be selective about working with those, those clients. We can, we can pick the clients that we want to work with. Um, so it actually has the, the opposite effect of, of what it may feel like, um, when you're when you're thinking about selecting a niche, so no, nobody's opening up about their um, if they're scared. Nobody wants to admit, yeah. yes, I'm scared, right? Or <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one, as a one question about how do I something that surprised me a little bit about the poll question is what do you think the barriers are? And sixty eight percent said it's building credibility. So I I've got a question okay. for Guillermo a little bit later about sort of how yeah. did we do that? But that's interesting. That surprises me that people think that would be 
the barrier in there. And Kelly, just to, to comment on what you said about agencies, it's totally true. And as you can imagine, one of our areas of competition is people wanting to hire a full-time CFO or controller to replace us. As companies get bigger, that makes sense. You can imagine people saying, oh, you're this big of a company, you should have someone full-time. I've had clients specifically say one of the things I'd really like is that we do work with many companies and we can say, here's what I'm seeing. And when you're in an industry like creative agencies, when the market has been tough like this year, they're all experiencing the same thing. Mm -hmm. Of my clients, the yeah. only exception is one that works directly with the government. And so you can say, well, so they're an exception because the government runs on a different kind of economy than everybody else. But all of you, and so here's what they're doing, and they love knowing what other people are doing and then what strategies they're employing. And so I've had people specifically say that's one of the big values we see because an internal person doesn't have that kind of perspective. They can't call their competitors and really get that kind of information. Right. Yeah. No, and, and and I would say it does it does has and has scared me, you know, as um more specialized because um and cannabis has gone through some some tough times as we'll talk a little bit kind of on the overall market. And we know like during the COVID years, the overall industry was really healthy and there's profitability. So that was, that was one of the things to look at is as, as an industry is not profitable, they may not spend so much on professional services. So the upside is that as an advisor, the service, you know, is not commoditized, but at the same time, it's a bit discretionary. And so that is something that scares me as, you know, I'm looking at the ebbs and flows in the industry of like, are these, you know, prospects going to be spending money on an advisory service? And yeah. so I think, you know, from the cannabis niche, I would say we're, we're early on, you know, the, it, it's a new industry. It's just starting to gain traction from a profitability standpoint. And then there's a lot of things from a regulatory standpoint, they're going to improve over the next couple of years. And so there is a lot of growth, but I think early on, it is something that that scared me to be so specialized and and really trying to understand if these companies were going to be spending dollars, uh, their budget on, on a virtual CFO. Yeah. Yeah. So we've got two questions now about how, so I think that's where, in the, and Kelly, you may notice that I am scared because I don't know where I should focus. So let's talk a little bit about how you choose a niche. Cause there may be this feeling oh easy for you. You got these four and you're going after them and maybe I'm convinced I need to do this. So at a conceptual level, we'll get a little bit more specific, but we are completely stealing the work of Jim Collins, who in the book, Good to Great, talks about this hedgehog concept. And the idea is very good companies can focus on something they do really well, and they keep doing that thing. And that's his big thing. And so he says, if you can have sort of these three intersecting circles, the more they intersect, just the better you can do that. So there are three for a company, but I would say it would be true for anyone choosing a niche would be one, what is it that you're passionate about? And Guillermo has talked about cannabis. And if he would tell more of his story, he would say why that is an industry that really speaks to him. For me with creative agencies, I happen to really enjoy the people that work in there. My undergrad degree was information technology and maybe agencies do IT development kind of things. The owners are sort of countercultural, kind of cool, sort of hip company people, and they're just fun to be around. And so for me, that's really cool. I know there are people who probably don't, I don't think that's good, but for me, that's sort of a, I'm passionate about it. What do you think you can be the best at? So is it an industry you're like, I get this industry and I understand how to help them measure that kind of stuff. And my skills can be really good at doing this. So me aligned with that, I could be really good at doing that would be another, or my company could. And then the economic engine are they big enough? And so I could use examples. When we coach firms, I've heard from many of, I would like to work with doctors and it's not all of them, but doctors by reputation are cheap when it comes to paying for this kind of service. They want their taxes done. And we've offered that and they're like, don't need you to go through and analyze how big my office should be and things like that. This is what I do. And so it tends to be, will they pay for that service? I've also had a lot of people say, I'm really drawn to things like life coaches or massage therapist kind of roles. It's wonderful, but many of those in that industry are individual uh, individual practitioners. So if you look at how much they can make in a year, think of a life coach charging people. And if, if I made up, if they could charge $250 an hour and work every single hour of the year, they'd make about a half million dollars, which is a ton of money on income, but they're not going to pay an accountant fifty dollars to $75,000 to provide this service. 
if I was our advisor, I would say you're crazy to spend that portion of your money on an accounting service, right? So they can't afford you. So you'd look and say, are there a high, is there a high quantity of groups of these? And maybe it's a life coaching service that has 15. And if there are tons of those out there, you've got yourself a niche, but you have to be careful to make sure people can afford that service. And I might go to the other extreme and say, if you love auto makers, for example, you probably look and say, okay, they're way too big, right? These are billion dollar companies. That's too big of a company in doing that. So let me pause for a second, see if Kelly and Guillermo have thoughts about these three questions. And then I've got one more thing to add. Yeah. When, what, to your, to your point about the people too, that that's a really good reason for choosing a niche. You know, if, if you have great people, you're not as passionate about the product itself and so forth, but you're passionate, you, you, you have great relationships in industry and you love mm. it for that reason. That's a good reason to be in the niche. And th that's a lot of my past too. And where I worked in construction, I worked with a lot of great people in cannabis. I, I will say it's not the most welcoming um, industry, but there's reasons for that. It's new. There's a lot of new business people. Um, there's also the fact of how the industry is, uh, you know, subject to a lot of maybe like more expensive services compared to other industries. Mm -hmm. And some have, you know, been taken advantage of that kind of thing. So there's a lot of speculation in the industry with outside service providers. And so getting my way into the industry just requires a lot of like being present um, continuously and building up that trust. And so um, that's not to say that there aren't great people, but in, in some industries, it's more welcoming than others. So, you know, that can vary, I'm sure, within the d niche that you're trying to get into. Yeah. And if you think of how to do it, if you have a lot of clients currently, most likely your niche could be with your existing clients. We were saying, which are the ones that seem to fit this profile? And if you don't, but you're thinking of a particular area, my suggestion would be as much as you can get a client or two like that and see if it's doing this. So I guess the opposite of that is sitting down with a blank sheet of paper and designing the best niche and say, I'm going to throw all my effort behind a particular industry when you've never had a client in that industry and don't know how it works. And I would say from creatives, ours came out of working with a client that we enjoyed and liked doing that. And as they chose it, they're like, there's really something here. But I think Jody and Adam would be happy to say they didn't sit down one day and invent creative agencies before we ever worked with one and said, we know what this looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then they also took the opportunity when they saw that like this, we, we really can speak to this industry. We, we understand right. like we're like-minded. I mean, they, they were very like-minded Jody and Adam with the, um, the, the creative agency kind of, you know, uh, creative agencies are very right. um, innovative. You know, they, they are um, technology savvy. They, you know, are a lot of, I mean, this was 13 years ago. Some of them were working remotely, which was, you know, mm -hmm not very common at that time. And, right. and, um, Jody and Adam loved that about it. Like it just kind of pushes, um, you know, push, pushed them a little bit to, to change things up in the accounting industry. So it was just very like-minded, I think, and it worked really well. Um, but I think, you know, when you're working with clients, um, you know, it takes just a little bit of like, you know, self-reflection or, you know, reflection on kind of what those relationships are like, kind of like, you know, Guillermo saying like, and just, you know, looking into those and seeing like, wh where, where do I fit the most? Um, Cause you might be, you know, thinking like, well, I just want to work with everyone. Right. But, sure. but like, um, but re the reality is like, you probably don't want to work with everyone. So like, what, what are those things, yeah. you know, <laughs> what are those pros and cons of the different industries um, that your, that your clients are currently in? And then, you know, really kind of honing in on, on the ones that you want to specifically focus on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's the knowledge and the interest. Cause I, I mean, I can say like from a knowledge standpoint, there's, there's some that is transferable. And then like, if I had to go into financial services or learn a lot of sec regulations, that might be a little bit daunting. It wouldn't be adjacent enough for me to just go in and, and work in that industry. Yeah. And one other thing to consider from sort of a macro economic level is if you're picking an industry kind of, where is it from a cycle? standpoint. And what I would say, if you're on the right hand of that curve, where it's either decelerating or tanking, you probably don't want to go after that, including they're probably just very mature in their processes. So if they're looking for key performance indicators and benchmarks and things, those might be really readily available. And then if you look at the beginning of those cycles, accelerating, that's kind of where you want to be the high growth companies and things. 
the very beginning of accelerating, you may think about, do I want to work with a lot of startup companies? And if that's appealing to you, it's wonderful. If it's something that not isn't, then maybe you want to work your way up that a little bit and say, I'd really like to work with people a little bit more established. And I think there's pros and cons of either of those that you look at your personality, but something else to consider. So you just don't pick an industry that's kind of going down. You're like, I got really good at the time that it was going away. So yeah. instead of talking all conceptually, sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, yeah, we used this. So the leadership team, when we sat down a year and a half ago, we used this chart to kind of walk or, you know, talk through some of the industries. Like, you know, we we have, I don't know how many CFOs we have right now, 12, I think, well, something like that. That's about right. Yeah. Um, and so we, you know, we were talking through like, you know, our, our CFOs, what was their previous experience? You know, what, what were those industries that they, you know, they worked in before and um, what are some of the industries that we want to pursue? And, and we started kind of mapping them out on here and going, well, you know, this industry is like, yeah, maybe it's a, a big industry, but we, we feel that it's decelerating or tanking right now. Right. Or, um, you know, some, some, uh, you know, the accelerating side of it. I was trying to think of like an example with like AI, you know, AI, for example, hmm. right now is one of those things, uh, you know, I don't know if you can tie that to like a company, right. But like AI SaaS companies or, you know, something mm -hmm. like, sure. you know, they're so new right now that um, there's, there's, it's a little iffy because you don't know if they're, if those companies are going to boom, but, but like as yeah. AI grows, it's going to get, go into that booming category where, mm -hmm. again, I don't know if that's an actual industry that you could, you could focus on, but just throwing that out there is like that, you know, something that's really new to everyone that will be, you know, in that booming area. Whereas, you know, things like, um, you know, newspapers are kind of on the, on the yeah. down, you know, so um, just those things that, that we were kind of mapping that out and saying like, what are those industries that would be the, the, um, have the most opportunity for growth and, and be the best um, fit for virtual CFO services? Yeah, that's a great point. So we've talked a lot conceptually. Guillermo, do you want to tell us a little bit about the cannabis industry? And I'm thinking of this in terms of kind of the analysis that, that we did to say, okay, yes, we think this is a valid niche for us to work in. Yeah. And I'll, I'll put that life cycle chart in context too, for, because for, mm. for cannabis, I've heard a lot of, um, you know, CPA firms or, you know, virtual CFO service providers say that cannabis is actually on the decline. Oh, and really? I would say in some ways, it depends how you're looking at it from a capital standpoint. It is, um, the profitability has been very tough, but it's been, it's had cash flow from a lot of, uh, capital coming into mm. into the industry from outside investors and then as kind of things have shaken out it's much tougher to be profitable in cannabis because uh of more competition and then just the economy in general is um the th what saves the, the industry is that there's high demand and the demand is just continuing to grow but the the pain point is that consumers are wanting more discounts and they're shop bargain shopping. And because the industry is so new, a lot of the retailers aren't sophisticated enough to know how to, you know, have pricing in place that will generate higher margins. And so that's really what's going on in the industry. And so when folks say it's on the decline, it's really just, it's the, the industry has grown very fast and the, the business side of it hasn't you know, kept up with that. Mm -hmm. And so with the regulatory environment uh, improving in more states legalizing, it's it's actually on the increase, not from a capital coming into the market, but possibly from profitability. And so that's why I see the opportunity there is that it's finally kind of starting to be more of a of a sophisticated industry from a from from a business standpoint, you know, and growing yeah. into more of a true CPG industry. But it's it's still going to take some time. But just some like some stats on like how I would look at it and just see is this an industry that's large enough that's got enough players that's got you know discretionary income for professional services is um, this chart here shows the number of uh, companies not just retailers but overall mm -hmm. licensed operators in all the different states and you see there Oklahoma. Oklahoma is really known for having unlimited licenses and not being a very mm. a great market. And so there's also that to look at, to put it in context is that, you know, to me, Oklahoma is not a great market because 
even from a banking standpoint, as I'm trying to help on the banking side, I know a lot of bankers won't work with the states that have unlimited licenses because it makes it more tough for them to be profitable. And so just understanding each of the markets, uh, not just the numbers is kind of what what helps me analyze what would be a particular state to to uh, put put my focus on. And you see California, of course, being the one of the largest markets, the oldest market, it has the most uh, the most uh, licensed operators. Um, most of them aren't profitable, but you do kind of want to focus on the ones that are and the ones that are uh, looking to scale and grow the business. So there's still opportunities within those states, and are there enough operators? And you know, you'd look at California and say, like, yeah, there there is, but that profit margin that you look at, that's something that I look at is 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 that profitability there um, within the different the different sectors? So that seven percent, it's about twenty percent for retailers, and really a third or maybe a fourth this year are actually profitable. So that's that's really kind of the the wheelhouse of where you know those companies are going to actually spend on on virtual CFO services. But this is what I was alluding to earlier: is just the the growth of if we go to the next slide and we'll kind of go through the growth, but you see the revenue growth um, through all those years, especially during the pandemic, mm-hmm. we can look at discretionary income as well. And then you see that it actually went up um, during the, the pandemic year. And so that's what really helped the industry there as well. Um, and then some declines, but it looks flat, but that just means that it's it's stable. Those are the growth yeah. rates that you see there on the blue chart and something that I would look at and see kind of how's the industry kind of growing overall. That's cool. So one one uh, number to throw out and Guillermo, I'd be interested in your reaction to this. David C. Baker is an advisor that works with a lot of agencies, but he works with other companies. And he has a definition around a niche that he'll say, if you're looking at niche, you should have between around 10 to 200 competitors and I think it's two to 10,000 prospects in that area. And you and I had an interesting conversation right before we started around, you know, if you find you're the only one that offers this service, you're in the mode of trying to convince people that this service makes sense versus having, you want some competitors out there that someone has defined the market that you're trying to say, I'm the one you want to pick in this market, not no one has a virtual CFO when they work with this kind of an industry. So now you're trying to convince them that you're the one to do it in there. Yeah. And just in general, right? Because many, many years ago, nobody even used the term virtual CFO. And to yes. me, it's like when I get a, a a call from a prospect that's like, ask a question, like, how much does it cost to hire a, a virtual CFO? It means that the service itself has already been established yes. and that cannabis operators are already using the term virtual CFO and they kind of have a an idea of what it is. But I agree with his, with his, uh, assessment there in the book and something that that I've thought about too is that as I was doing this is like is there a lot of um advisory work going on uh firms in in the in the industry and there is some you know but mm-hmm. I also saw that as an opportunity as I I don't see a lot that understand what it takes to be profitable in cannabis and that really has their hands around you know, the KPIs and, and all that is, is easy to learn as long as you kind of get immersed in the industry. But yes, definitely. If you look around and no one's, you know, offering the service in the industry and it's a large industry, it's probably, there's probably a reason why it hasn't yeah. matured or it, it, like you said, the digital agencies mm-hmm. embrace the remote work, you know, uh, maybe some industries don't as much as you mentioned, uh, doctors or physician practices. And so that's something to look at is like, what are other service providers doing out there already? Yeah. One of the, if you can take maybe a minute or so, Cameron, one of the questions what, where you saw the biggest response to our barrier was people saying, how do I learn about the industry? Can you say a couple of things that you've done? Cause you, you've shown, you know, a lot about the cannabis industry. What are some of the things you've done that you might help someone say, well, here's what you can do to learn more. Yeah. Well, first of all, just being, being, you know, if you chose the right niche, you're, you're interested in it. So you're going to sure. want to go to the conferences or be involved in the trade groups. And so I think that's a lot of what, what drives it is your, your interest in cannabis because it's so regulatory driven. There's just endless opportunities in every state to get involved, whether they have a ballot initiative or, or, uh, some kind of regulatory initiative going on in each of the states. So most of the states have a trade group and that's a really 
easy way to get involved because one, you kind of, you show the industry that you're on their side, you're, you're pushing things forward, but also because you get involved in the conversations and that's something that happens at conferences or, or being involved in these groups is that you, you really do get involved in conversations and having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with your potential prospects about what they're going through. You put your name out there and build a lot of trust and it's a really easy to, way to get, get your way in there. Yeah. I think it's a great answer. And if you work with clients, I mean, for us, you're working with people. So you've got that experience, educational opportunities. And for me, there've been some books related to creative agencies that have been helpful. And then finding conferences and organizations to join are all different ways that you can learn. And then at the same time as you're learning, you're starting to get yourself established as a thought leader, which is really important and probably leads Kelly to our next slide to talk about You've got your niche. What the heck do you do with it? Yeah, what now, right? Yeah. Um, so our our approach at Summit with marketing um, is an inbound approach. So um, spoiler alert, when you're looking at this uh, this uh, slide here, we're on the left side. Um, so that traditional traditional marketing, um, especially for accounting firms, is is typically on the outbound side. So um, you think of like print advertising, cold calls, direct mailing, um, you know, TV, radio ads, telemarketing, those kinds of things. Um, what we do is the inbound approach. So here we are, we're in a webinar, right? Um, that's uh, part of our, our marketing strategy. Um, and, and, you know, we talked earlier about kind of the time that it took to go from, we want to go into this niche to like, we actually launched the niche. And it, um, granted there were other things going on there from a branding perspective because we had had gone through a merger. So we also had to figure out some branding, um, you know, considerations, but, um, but, you know, taking Guillermo and saying, okay, we want, you know, he is the thought leader, but we want to like really elevate him, um, you know, in, in, in the world, right? Like it, mm -hmm. online. Um, and so part of what we started doing with Guillermo, my, my team started working with Guillermo on getting him, um, you know, mem a membership to every cannabis organization that we could find. And we were looking for those opportunities for how can we get him in front of the, in front of those audiences um, so that he, you know, being able to speak to those audiences, network within those groups. Um, and then, so we started doing social media, con you know, developing content, with Guillermo um, and, you know, email marketing is another in, uh, can be an inbound tactic, but we don't do a lot of email marketing, but um, so all of these things we started doing. Um, and I, I think a lot of times people, you know, I have, I have, I have a team of people, right. But it used to be just me. So, um, you know, I think, you know, it, it can be really overwhelming for a, a firm owner to, you know, if you are, um, by yourself or have a small team uh, to think about doing all of these things, right? And and I would never say that anyone should start out with doing all of these things, but um, I typically would say, you know, start where you are, you know, what are the things that you can start doing? Um, and, you know, so so blogging maybe is a thing that that you can start doing to, to start um, kind of developing your SEO, um, driving people to your website, doing a little bit of social media marketing. I mean, you can start small, um, but you do want to look for those kind of bigger opportunities for speaking and getting in front of your audience. Um, we, and you can go to the the next slide here, Tom. Um, yeah. Again, it's kind of just like um, going into the, digging into the inbound strategy a little bit more, but these are kind of all of those things. I think maybe you have to do one more click to get the last oh. uh, couple of images on there. I'm not sure why that happened, but um, sure. yeah, there we go. So these are all of the things that we, um, that we do, right? So we try to build that community. Um, Jody has written a couple of books. We have another one of our thought leaders who is currently writing a book and, you know, Guillermo will be soon after that. Um, I don't know if you know that yet, Guillermo, but <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it's fine. Um, and then, you know, we have actually Guillermo on a podcast tour right now. So we are um, we are getting him out on a number of podcasts. And, and podcasts are a great way to reach audiences um, with a kind of a minimal time investment. Um, it takes time, but uh, it, it does help you get out there um, where you don't have to do a lot of preparation. You know, you know your, your stuff, you know your topic, right? But you go and you guest on podcasts. Um, social media, Guillermo does a lot of social media posting, um, several times a week on, on, uh, LinkedIn and kind of just establishing his expertise there. Um, you know, he, he is the expert, but it's about kind of informing 
the world at, that you are the expert and and um, helping other people recognize you as that. Um, so all of these things, this is the thought leadership approach that we take. And again, I mentioned talking with somebody yesterday who's going through our course who said, um, you know, like basically, you know, what do I, what do I do? How do I, how do I, you know, mm -hmm. accomplish this goal of growth? Um, and these are all the things that I, that I talk about with, with firm leaders all the time um, that again, you don't have to do all of the things, but um, starting where you are and and starting to develop that thought leadership con content um, and putting it out there, all of these things start working together as this, this engine. I, I call it our content engine. You know, we, we do a podcast, we turn that into a blog post, we put that on social media. I mean, and it just keeps kind of, the wheels keep turning and turning um, the more you're, you're doing. And, and it can be like something where you devote an hour a week to it at first mm -hmm. until you can hire people to help you or kind of grow that. And, and again, that's, like I said, six years ago, I was the only person on the team. Now I have a team of about six people. Um, and that is because of the growth that we have been able to generate through all of these, these methods. Yeah. Yeah. Kelly, and I would agree too that, that, um, these things do work together. Like right now I'm working on an article, uh, editing an article working on for a entrepreneur. And I'm also speaking on a podcast this afternoon. Well, that gets your in, that gets you into the thought processes. Like yes. maybe what I'm working in this article, I'm also going to be speaking about um, this afternoon. And so, all these things help generate um, what we call, you know, thought leadership. It helps you generate your own thoughts and views and approach to consulting or whatever it may be. It's not just the work of it, but what I've found really valuable in writing the articles or speaking is to develop my own thoughts. And that's what really yeah. thought leadership is for me has been all about. And I want to um, address the the thing that probably most people don't talk about too, is that imposter syndrome can kind totally, of- That's uh, where I was going, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, imposter syndrome is a thing, you know? Um, yeah. And, and for me, it, you know, what really helped me as I was getting into the podcasting is um, the book that I- I purchased this this book about it and it said you, you don't have to be the only expert you know sometimes we think that when we are speaking that we're the the number one expert in the entire world and you may get to that point we just have to be an expert and you're you're an, an expert mm -hmm. by the fact that you've had years of experience in accounting as a CPA as an advisor however that may be but take whatever that experience is and you're you're uh, an expert by your education and, and the experience that you've had so far up to this point. So you can definitely use your own, leverage it, make it your own. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I know Tom, we're probably getting close on time here. I just a mm -hmm. uh, final thought on that. Yeah. I do think it it is so hard to think of yourself as a thought leader. Like you don't, I think most sure. people are just like, you know, I, what do I really know? Right. I mean, we don't think of ourselves as being um, these knowledgeable experts. It's, in fact, when Tom introduced us as the experts, Guillermo, I was like, oh, that's us. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a weird, <laughs> yeah, 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 like you're talking about us. Right. <laughs> so it's a weird, it's a weird feeling. Right. But the more you like that, I love what you just said, the more you start putting that content out there and, you know, you're writing these articles, you're talking on these podcasts and you start realizing like, oh, I do know what I'm talking about. Like, I know something that other people don't know. And the more I talk about it, the more I realize that I am the expert in this, right? And mm -hmm. um, so some of it, it just takes like doing it and just just kind of forcing yourself to get over that feeling of imposter syndrome and that feeling of like, I don't know what to do and just start moving forward and you get better as you go along. Yeah, that's a great, great point. So last question we had, do you think it will offer benefits? And we've got 82% either saying tremendous is a little bit more than half and the remainder saying moderate. Um, so whether we convince people or they came in knowing that's why I took a niche course, I'm not <laughs> sure which. So a couple of closing comments. So keep learning. I did look back. There are two. So we do a podcast. There are two episodes you can find on YouTube. Episode 102 is called Niche Down, Price Up with Geraldine Carter. So if you want a little bit more about someone who talks about right. this kind of thing and sort of how to increase your prices around that. And then 104, we've got an exciting um, guest. Guillermo is on there talking more about cannabis industry. So if that industry in particular, more that niche, you've got those two, but lots of episodes we would hope people would take advantage of. If you want to be a little bit more interactive, we've got the CFO community, 344 members of this community. So people get in and they can ask each other questions and we moderate that information. You can see you've got a free month access so you can get in and kind of check out and see if that's for you. 
We've talked a lot about providing CFO services and Kelly mentioned someone taking our course. So you can see what the course is. It's a pretty intensive course, 15 modules, but it goes through everything that we do from marketing to pricing, to delivering services, to onboarding and people. I, it's everything that we go through as you complete, you can get a free coaching session. Kelly also works with people who just are saying, I'm taking it, I want some help with this. And once a week, we do a, what we call a fireside chat where people call in and we talk about how their experiences are going. So it's sort of a mastermind-like group and you can see free subscriptions and things. So if this appeals to you, this is really a good way to jumpstart your education around this. And then finally, if you're like, oh, that sounded good, but can't I just join you guys instead of learning how to do this myself? Yes, we are hiring and we'd love people to check out career opportunities with us. Kelly Guillermo, thank you very much. I think this was hopefully really valuable to people. I think from the questions and comments, it seems like it was landing pretty well in there. So thanks for offering your expertise today. Yeah. Thanks for having us on. It was fun. Hope everyone has a fantastic thanks. day.